Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at another submission, a second submission, by Lindsay with her horse, Soon. And the first submission that we saw of Soon, his walk was very, very stifled, and we can already see that that's already starting to improve immensely. She said it's been about two months since the last video. So we're already seeing a better walk. I'm seeing a better definition in the top line already. That's good, even though you don't. I've watched the whole video, of course, so I know where this is going, and the horse gets better and better as we go along here, so that's very good. And don't ever apologize, as you said, you're doing quite a bit of walk work. You know, the walk is the most important gate, really, that we have. As Nuno Oliveira used to say, it's where we explain everything to the horse. And if we can get them working and understanding things without getting in such a big fight with them, as we do sometimes, if they don't understand something in the trot or canter, and we try to enforce our will upon them, it's much easier to take it slowly in the walk and really get them swinging and active over their backs and relaxed before we get them too fit. That's the other thing, also, if you're working with thoroughbred horses, you know, if you you spend a lot of time walking, they don't get so hyper fit, whereas if you go right into the trot, and then even if you do work them down, you, it tends to take a really long time, and they add a lot of uh, physical condition that way. So by walking them, you also avoid, you know, with a hot type horse, of getting them overfit by trotting too much. You know, everyone has to remember, you know, when you, if any of you have ever seen horses trained at the racetrack, it doesn't take, look how fit they are, but they're only out there for about 10 or 15 minutes. You know, they basically, you know, trot one direction in the track and a little bit of breezing and they're done and look how fit they are. Well, thoroughbred horses and hot horses tend to get fit very quickly, so we have to be careful of that and always take that into consideration when we're training. But look how lovely this walk is just starting to swing. He's getting more flexion in his hocks there. His back legs don't look like they're pulling up out of the mud, so to speak, like they're stuck in the dirt. But he's really starting to get really, really nice here. And as you go along, it's just, I like your leg yields are very good. It's just moving away quietly from your inside leg. That's what you want to see. Though he, in time, will start to stretch and cross over a little more in those leg yields. That's quite nice there. Once again, I love how you're just taking your time. Keep trying to open up the walk so it gets longer and more active all the time and swinging. We can't spend too much time doing that. That is unless the horse is hollow in the back. In this case, we can do too much time. But once again, if you have the right things happening, you know you can do a lot of walk work and a lot of explaining to the horse, so to speak, while at the same time warming him up and preparing him for the more arduous work of the trot and canter work that's going to be more impact, going to have a higher impact that is on the horse's legs and that sort of thing. So if we spend plenty of time in the walk first, really getting the horse swinging and active, it really saves a lot of wear and tear on the horse. So this is good, and I love how you're not really demanding anything happen here. You're just gradually getting the horse swinging more active, the walk becoming more rhythmic, the step is coming through a little more. And that's what we want to keep happening. You know, we want to let the rhythm of the horse and the position of the back guide our training. We don't want to spend a lot of time going around on a hollow-backed horse, because every step we do just re-encourages them to be hollow. So we spend our time just really getting the stretching in the walk, Especially if you have a nervous kind of horse or a, a very fit horse, it, uh, it really goes a long way to letting that fitness kind of go off the horse a little bit and, uh, and get them relaxed and swinging over the back. Now, if you're preparing horses for um, endurance type work, which you can, in this exact same manner, you simply would just, you know, our rule of thumb is, you know, if you can't keep the horse back up, you've gone on too long. So. You know, just let that be your guide, but you'd be amazed at how quickly you can get the horse to work over its back because that's really where it's comfortable. Once you let it understand that, you'll as we get into this, you'll find your horse asking to stretch. It'll kind of start trying to seek down on its own when it starts getting tired or when, or when it starts wanting to make itself more comfortable in the position that it's in. You know, once again, that's why so many people encounter so much difficulty with horses. It's just they're putting them in positions that makes it impossible for the horse to do the work. So by doing this, we get the horse into a frame that makes it easy for him to do the work, and then they're usually quite happy to do it. There, this walk is getting longer and more active now. So he's starting to stretch into the contact better. And once again, you, 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 know, you can't do this too slowly, so to speak. Taking your time is never something that you uh, can do too much of. It always pays off in the end. Very nice, and that was a really nice leg yield. Like how the horse just softly moved over there. Now, one thing you could try to do, just as a rider, there is just get your chin up a little bit. So remember, when you're doing this, don't drop your head down. But you know, it's certainly fine to look down and see what the horse is doing. But try not to look down with your whole head, so to speak. But just glance down with your eyes, so you don't throw yourself out of position when you do that, because it only takes a matter of putting your head forward. 
uh, to throw your weight forward. And we want to stay centered above the horse. I would like to see you just lifting your chest up there a little bit as you ride, just flattening your shoulder blades into your back a little more. There, you're starting to do that a little bit of there. And just think about those few simple things to improve a little bit for yourself. Don't let your shoulders become rounded down. Nice. This is all very good. Once again, just really taking your time and, you know, just watch how is this horse is going, how the top part of the neck is becoming more engaged. You can see it thickening, so to speak, and you can see the underside of the neck softening. That's what you want to see when your horse is working over its back. You don't want to see the horse tense. Sometimes people are fooled by horses that have been draw reined, you know, because they look like the top of the neck is, is developed, but then when you look at the back, it isn't developed at all, and you'll also notice that the underside of the neck is always developed. You know, and usually when people draw rein horses to get, the, unless they draw the rein them, which they always do, eventually to the point where the horse is just behind the bit all the time and actually not accepting contact, but just curling its neck over, breaking in the neck. You know, you want to avoid those kinds of things because then the horse will not be working over its back and everything will just deteriorate. So once again, as I say, when you see horses that have been draw reins, as soon as they take the draw reins off, you see how thick the underside of the neck is. And usually the horses don't stay down anyway, as soon as they take the draw reins off. And once again, unless, until they've draw reined them to the point that they've broken the horse in the neck, that is, that it overflex the third or fourth vertebrae. Beautiful right there. I love how this horse is just going right into that stretch. And once again, you can just, as you get that, just keep encouraging that little bit longer, more swinging active trot. But this is already looking well improved over what I saw in the first submission. And what a nice character this horse looks like, you know, and how so many of them, you know, when you see people fighting with horses and horses being resisted, there's always a reason for it. And it's almost always that the rider is putting the horse in a position that it actually can't do the work that they're asking them to do. You know, so some horses will, if you browbeat them forever, will learn to accept that and they'll go with their necks broken and this sort of thing in this sort of sad kind of manner. But if you want a horse to really express itself and to become expressive in its movements, you know, we have to, they have to feel free. That is, there can't be anything holding them back. If you're holding back against the mouth of the horse, which is the craziest thing, I will never understand how anybody ever thought that, that, that this was going to do you any good. I mean, if you basically are holding against the mouth of the horse, as so many people are doing today, you're basically got the brakes on all the time. I mean, no wonder the horses are wringing their tails and swishing their teeth, and, or rather grinding their teeth and swishing their tails. Very nice. Look how beautiful that is. Now look as he stretches down what happens to the back end. This is what you need to watch. And watch how that hawk started making a much rounder circle. The horse immediately started stretching uh, down and swinging the hind legs more right there. You can see the hawk start working more actively as the horse begins to work over its top line. So that's really good. And what a lovely rhythm this horse has. You know, and when you get used to riding horses like this and you realize how much fun it can be. You know, I mean, there are people who like to fight with horses. They just simply get a big thrill out of it. It makes them feel, you know, like the same kind of person. It's bullying. It's just like the kid who bullies other kids or the adult who bullies adults. You know, it's the same thing. You're bullying an animal into doing something. And sometimes you can get away with it. But, you know, almost everybody, every bully that I've ever seen in my life, both human and <laughs> whether they're on horse or they're directing at a horse or human, they usually end up getting their just desserts eventually. As I said, um, if you ride in that manner, you know, you may get away with it for years, but there'll come a time where you push a horse too close to the edge and you will get hurt. And I've just seen it hundreds and hundreds of times being in this business as long as I have. There, look how beautiful that is. And look how soft the underside of the neck is. That's what we're looking for right there. Good. Look how easily there, right there. That's what we want to see. And just know that over time, you know, and as I said, you may have people come up to you, oh, you're riding your horse on the forehand so much. Well, once again, look at the back legs. It's the back legs that make the difference of whether the horse is on the forehand, not the neck. It doesn't matter whether the horse's neck is down or up. If the horse is hollow in the back, it's on the forehand, no matter how high it brings its knees up. You know, so people just need to start looking at the back end. And that's what dressage was supposed to be all about, the correct riding, the developing horses over time through logical gymnastic exercises. That's what dressage is. And this thing that it's turned into now of people, you know, hurrying horses along and severe bits and draw reins and all of all of the other horrible practices that we're now seeing. People trying to do piaffa massage by wrapping horses in the front legs and pulling their front legs. I mean, all of these kind of things are antithetical to what dressage ought to be and what its uh, founders sort of uh, idealized, which was that is taking the pain 
and that whole idea of browbeating horses, you know, away, that the horse becomes a partner with you in the work, and that will only be a partner with you in the work if they like the work, and this is the only way to get them to do that. Very nice, look how beautifully, and you know, you can tell. I mean, look at any of my videos, and look at the video of this horse, and you can see this horse is not unhappy about the work that it's doing. Beautiful, it's quite relaxed about it. Very nice there. That's where you want him to be. That's really good. That's really good. And what you'll find over time, as the horse's back strengthens and you see that hole fill in behind the back, the horse's head and neck will just come up naturally all by itself. Once again, as the withers will pull up through the, through the shoulders and the horse will look more uphill. This is really good, just like this. And I love how you're keeping it simple. Once again, that's the other thing that people do is they overcomplicate things. I see dressage trainers all the time telling people, take that horse, drive him into the corner. Well, when you drive a horse like this into the corner, what do you think is going to happen? It can't turn the corner because it's too. it doesn't have the balance and ability yet or strength to do that. So it's going to either pull its head up or it's going to slow down, one or the other. So do the exercises in a way that's appropriate for you. Once again, we start right away you know, with horses doing lateral works and these kind of things, but in a long frame with the head and neck stretched out. So the horse, we never want, if you feel your lateral work shortening the horse, that tells you that you brought the head and neck up too high for his level of development. But just the way you're doing this is really, really good. And once again, shows how people, if you just get the right principles, you know, if you can ride a little bit like this person can, like Lindsay can here, you know, she obviously is comfortable on the back of a horse. She can walk, trot in a canter. There's no reason why you can't train your horses all the way to Grand Prix. You know, once you understand these basic principles of what it takes to get there. And every horse you ever ride, whether you want to go Grand Prix or not, will become, you know, happy in its work and a safe mount. You know, a person holding against a horse's mouth is not safe. You know, we, everyone's gotten on this big kick now, and everyone should wear helmets. I'm not telling you not to wear a helmet. But, you know, you would be far better off riding your horses over its back and not wearing a helmet than wearing a helmet and going around on one upside down that's fighting you the whole way and holding against your hands. That's what makes horses fall down is when you hold against the hands. If a horse ever starts to trip with you, that's the first thing you should learn is how to slip the rein so you don't clutch against the mouth of the horse because that will bring the horse right down on top of you. And that's how so many people get hurt. But this is so nice. I've even seen a little thrust now. As this is going on, I'm seeing a little more thrust. That is the push off the ground from the hind legs in this horse. Starting to have a little more cadence there. That is that accentuation of rhythm that gives you that little push. And you're starting to have a little bit of suspension there. It's coming. This is really, really nice. Excellent work. So once again, you can do your leg yields. You can do your shoulders for you can, do, you can even start the horse in half pass very soon. But you want to do that, once again, in the order of the exercises. So when, when you're ready to start moving into the direction of the bend, which is maybe not a little while down the road for you with this horse, um, try it in the walk. We always start, everything starts at the walk. And as we get the horse to do something, we get it to understand what we want in terms of the lateral movement in the walk. Then we simply try it in the, can, in the trot, rather, and then ultimately in the canter. So the horse does everything in all three gates. But this is really beautiful here. This is so good. Now, look at the hocks now. Look how deep the horse is stepping under the body. Look how much more flexion in the hock there is now. Now, when I first saw this horse, he was very short strided, and this, is, this has improved immensely. You know, I almost thought he was a little foot sore in the first video that I saw of you, but now this horse is swinging beautifully. Its stride is getting longer, I'm sure, by the day. Really excellent work. I love how you're making these nice big turns, keeping it simple within the scope of what the horse can do. Beautiful, like that. Now, once again, what this also does for the rider, you know, by learning to ride in this way, the riding shapes the rider. Like, you know, when I'm giving lessons, you'll find that I spend very little time worrying about what the rider is doing in terms of their position because I get them to do things. And the things they do, the classical system, will also shape the horse, and the, and the shape of the horse will shape the rider. That is learning to ride without holding against the mouth of the horse. And that's what what's every rider should learn to do. I certainly wish, you know, that I had school horses that I could lunge people on, this sort of thing, as is suggested, you know, and very many Europeans think, oh, well, you got to get on a lunge line for a year before you get loose. Well, the problem is, you know, what they forgot to tell you at the Spanish riding school is that in order to do that, you have to have a horse that has 15 years old with 10 years of, you know, correct work under its belt. So it's developed really correctly, you know, so that you can spend that kind of time on its back on a lunge line, especially if you're in the sitting trot. So if you do that to an unformed horse, like most of you probably have, 
you will end up creating way more problem than you had to begin with because the horse's back will collapse and it will get sore and it will start hating the work that you're doing. This is also, once again, a beautiful canter, and it's also gotten a little scopier since I saw the last one. This horse canters beautifully over its back, and once again, that's our rule. And a lot of thoroughbreds do. They are built to canter, so very often we find that they canter over their backs better than they trot. Not every one of them. I'd say 10%, something like that, that I run into, but it's very common in thoroughbred horses because, once again, that's what they were ultimately bred to do. Very nice. And that is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you look how light the rain contact and how lovely the horse is just staying over its back the entire time. There's no rhythm. And as you have learned yourself, now that you can do this, this makes jumping simple. When I watch so many people trying to jump horses today, it's hilarious to listen to some of the crazy things the trainers tell them to try to get a distance. The way you get a distance is by getting a horse round over its back so you can just roll down to the fence and go. I mean, you never have to adjust more than three feet. That's all the horse is ever going to be out one way or another. You know, so that either means just slowing down a little bit or just opening the horse up just a slightly bit. But what you'll find is that when you learn to ride horses like this down to fences, they quickly learn how to just open up that little bit that they need to or not, as the case may be, and they just roll down and they take the jump in stride. But when I see people you know, trying to make jumping into this very, very complicated thing, you know, and then you go to the horse shows. I'm seeing way too many people going to hospitals from horse shows today. Once again, the warm bloods jump so easily, but once again, it's, it's, it's not whether you can ride a horse when it's, when everything is going right is whether you can ride them when it goes wrong. And so what happens is we see these horses that jump so easily, but then something goes wrong and the riders don't really have any bad, any experience and the horses don't have enough experience. So it, it all, it all goes badly, so to speak. And very often these beautiful horses end up stopping and uh, then you've got a real problem on their hands. If they find out that you really don't have any real control up there or you're putting there in the way that gets them. You know, if you're trying to place a horse, so to speak, and the system that we see people doing with jumpers today where they're jacking the horses back, they run like crazy, then try to jack the horses back onto their hindquarters, you know, five strides out from a fence and then, you know, make them jump out of some hole. You know, that just doesn't work. It, it, what ends up happening is ultimately you'll get in front of a fence that the horse can't make it over and it'll fall down in the middle of it and that's where you will get hurt. You know, but if you jump like this, this is just how you should be. Just as Jack Legoff used to say, jumping is just dressage with fences in the way. So you just imagine yourself right there. Just put a fence in the way and boom, it just rolls down to it and over it without a lot of drama and that's what you want. And that's what I'm sure you're going to get out of this horse the way you're doing this. This is absolutely wonderful. And look how long the horse is dry. This is really a great example. Everyone should go back and watch the first videotape of this horse and then watch this videotape. Look how well the horse's neck is starting to develop. It's really thickened up. And behind the saddle there also, there's quite a difference than there was when I saw the horse the last time. Absolutely beautiful. And also look how easily the horse is bending. You know, that's the other thing that people overcomplicate. If your horse is hollow in the back, it's going to be impossible to bend it. That's what allows bend to happen. The horse must be longitudinally bent. That is, the back must be lifted before you can get lateral bend. But I see people, they think they have bend and all they're really doing is cranking the neck from one side to the other. This is absolutely beautiful though right here. This is so nice and so swinging. Such an improvement of this horse. This is really going to be a wonderful horse for you who should be able to do just about anything you want. You'll also be amazed at you know, the, the levels of dressage you will be able to do if you give a horse like this a chance to develop enough to be able to do it. Once again, that process of a horse like, you know, with any horse takes two years to develop their top line to the point where they can, uh, are able to collect you know, with some degree of efficiency. And also, collection is dependent on that change that the horse has to go through in its body. That is the withers pulling up through the shoulders and, you know, the back becoming strong. This is absolutely fantastic. And I love your leg yields. It's just easy and over just like that. This is just how this horse should be worked, how every horse should be worked. It's wonderful to see you doing this on your own. Excellent example for all the people around you, I hope, in your barn who are watching this. Look how swinging and active. Once again, look how beautiful the horse's neck looks now. How free the shoulder is able to move. So can you imagine now, think about it. If you pulled the horse's head up and suddenly held against his mouth, what do you think you would have? Nothing. Unfortunately, many of these warm bloods built today, you know, they're such good movers, such fabulous movers that people can do all these things to them. And even though they're hollow, to those who don't know, it looks like something. I love how you just ease the horse back to the walk. That's exactly how you should do it. You never want to slam on the brakes. We never want the horse to slide into a stop, so to speak, because that's just like slamming on the brakes in your car. It's going to put way too much pressure on the horse's legs. 
Really nice swinging walk. It's where every walk, every exercise session should begin and end at the same place, walking and swinging. If you can't if you can't get on the horse and get it swinging through in the walk, then you should be lunging it before you get on there. Simple as that. Or working in hand if you know how to do that as an interim step. This is really, really good. So congratulations, Lindsay. You've done a great job with this horse. I expect great things from you. It's absolutely wonderful. That next swinging and active long. And I already see, as I said, look behind the saddle right there. That's a good place to compare. You know, you don't need to see horses trained to know how they've been trained. Just look at their muscling and it'll tell you. This is wonderful. Big swinging walk. So this has been Will Faber from Art to Ride. Another wonderful session with Lindsay and her horse soon. See you next time. Thank you so much for the good work.